Hi folks, Sam here in Relove Guitars Workshop and welcome to uh, another workshop video this weekend. And uh, if I get distracted it's because somewhere in here there's a big fly and it's annoying me with some loud buzzing. Anyway, um, got quite a few things to do this weekend. Um, I'm, gonna get, I'm not really quite sure what I'm going to kick off with, but I think I'm going to kick off with um, stripping down this Sun Mustang. And this is uh, another one of the beautiful, beautiful, it's a little bit, had a, you know, worse for wear after a long hard life, but it's uh, an Indian made Fender licensed guitar. And I think this one uh, has got a thing on the back that says inspected on, in March, 1990. So it's, uh, I'm not quite sure how late in the Indian manufacturing um, sequence this is, but <clears throat> anyway, you can see these were, these were made from the eighties um, onwards up to a point and then they stopped um, and the, they withdrew the license or something but this uh, this is a great guitar this is really heavy for a start and it's not ply by the way it's this solid wood of some kind it has the guitar the strings have incredible sustain on them something to do with the, the solidity of the body and the way it's constructed uh, there's people not that um, don't have that many good things to say about Sun Mustang, but these Indian ones, the people who are in the know, uh, I think really like them. There's a there's a, a, a die-hard set of fans for these, uh, and I'm really keen on taking them and upgrading them a little bit, uh, as well as giving them a really really good quality setup. And from that, what we get is a really really nice vintage feel guitar. So <clears throat> today, um, that's what I'm kind of looking at really is uh, taking this one apart and then probably I have a feeling that I might refret both of these necks because this one is just a little bit close to the um, close to the deck uh, and that's uh, of course what you'll get with guitars that have a vintage from you know the 90s or 80s you know if they've been well played and this one appears to have been they, they will eventually um, yeah they'll be they'll be worn out in the frets department well, luckily, I have uh, all I need to refret these guitars um, now, and I've got plenty of frets. <clears throat> I'm thinking of turning this one into a, a 7.25 radius guitar, uh, making it a very sort of classic um, Strat profile. This is a little bit flatter than I like for this kind of guitar, but um, and I and I think it's probably a nine uh, inch, 9.5 or whatever the, the nine radius is. But again, I can check that out shortly and. Um, We'll see. So this guitar, um, rather like rather like the uh, Korean Squire that this neck came off, both these guitars, uh, I've been sort of stung a little bit and I'm pretty much lost. I will lose any profitability in it for me. So, you know, both guitars have cracks in the neck that need taken care of, um, well cracks, sorry, cracks in the finish around here, but it's, you know, I have to go in there and check out whether it's structural and then I need to repair the, the finish around that so it doesn't look horrible. And both of them came with um, worn out um, worn out frets. And in both cases, I asked the sellers sp specifically about the condition here and both of them assured me there were no cracks at all, which is bullshit, basically. This was a gum tree purchase. That other one was a, a, an eBay. So it's very difficult to avoid getting slightly stitched up in in buying on um, buying on eBay or um, by Gumtree, and you know it's one of the reasons why I'm committed to being um, truthful about the guitars that I sell. Because you know, there's the last thing in the world I's, I'd want somebody to feel that sense of disappointment when they open the thing and look in and they go, "Oh, he didn't tell me the frets are worn out. Christ, you know, I'm going to have to replace them." Or I hate the way they feel because they're right down in, and my fingers are always on the wood. Um, so I don't do that, uh, and so on these case, on these both of these guitars, then I'm going to refret both of them because there's no point selling them on with. I don't want to play them with the frets as low as they are, and people who want to buy them. So I'm going to do the work that it takes to refret both of them, and I'm going to put them out as beautiful um, classic uh, strap guitars with lots of life left in them because I'll have done the work. But I won't make my money. I'll break even, but I won't make any profit on it. For all the hard work, but that's what you get if you um, if you get caught by somebody selling who isn't 
particularly honest. Um, but it is, unfortunately, it's it's par for the course, isn't it? It's what you know goes with the territory. So there's no way of avoiding it other than uh, you know, if you if you constrain yourself to only buying from sellers um, who who you know showed photographs of that part of the guitar, um, then you might you very likely find that your range of guitars you can buy kind of shrinks down quite a bit because um, I think there's only certain kinds of sellers who will show that part of uh, part of the guitar. I'm just, by the way, I'm just taking a moment to check um, another guitar I'm, I'm pitching on. 40 minutes to go and uh, what I don't know is what the... Um, let's have a look at what the current bid is. <clears throat> I did send a message asking... Uh, if this person, if they sold it, or if I bought, would they be prepared to meet at a particular station? Because um, that's obviously quite a big deal if you buy, you have to travel a little bit. The last thing you want to be doing is traipsing around the world. I've got no reply on that. So anyway, sometime along the way in the not too distant future, I'll find out whether I've got that one or not. Okay, so let's go straight into the work I'm going to do on this. Just going to literally pile in. There's no no time like the present. Get these strings off and um, get this guitar split off into all its parts, so I can give them all a good clean up. But also then, um, so that I'm able to um, start work on removing these frets and get ready to refret. Uh, actually, reprofile and then refret. Um, it's nice to be able to do that. Having the equipment to do it is great. Um, dun. It, it, I think in you know although I'm uh, slightly annoyed at people being not being frank about the condition of the guitar and um, you know having lost the, the profitability part of it for me, what is really still good for me in really loved guitars terms is you know I'm 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 basically I'll break even but I'm. I like to see it like I'm getting paid to learn something. And so for me, uh, doing these uh, necks on this guitar is more practice with um, uh, refretting, which is great, and re-radiusing. Re so I kind of, ultimately, I, I'm not not really losing out when, it, when it's all said and done. Now, just as I'm doing this, um, I'm noticing that the, the back plate on this guitar is in fairly worn out state so we'll either need to find a, a really cheap value good value fairly vintage looking one or we'll do our best to um, stabilize the cracks that are in this plate um, the nice thing about these old oh god there goes that fly damn yeah the nice thing about these old sun mustangs is of course they're, they're not we're not expecting them to look um, new. You know, they have lived. They're very, very old guitars. Um, so it doesn't matter that they have some bits, chips or dents or whatever. Uh, that's, part, that's part of the character of them. But, obviously, uh, we want to make them play and, and be structurally sound and, and to play to the their best potential. And that's what Real Love Guitars is all about. So, so straight away off come the, the strings the way into the string pile. And um, this this guitar is literally... Oh, go away. Go away! I'm going to have to do this. I'm so sorry. Yep, it's not a very kind thing to do. But, um, it's not going to be a good life tra caught trapped in here. Um, yes, yeah, so this this we'll take everything apart um, and put everything in the container over here and um, get straight into the neck. Now with, with the neck bolts, um, once you take them out, what you want to be doing is looking for any shims on the neck as you go into the. As you take the neck off, you're looking to see if it's shimmed up in any way. And a shim is a, a little piece of uh, material that's put under there to change the, the angle of the neck. 
um, sometimes or sometimes it's done to raise the uh, raise the neck to meet the strings. So I'm just going to turn it over, and what I want to do is gently lever this neck out or ease this neck out. It's very tight or very snug, I should say, um, and it comes out very well. Now it's one of these uh, that has a truss rod that's um, in this end, and it's uh, it's a it's a bit grubby, so I need to clean that out. And I don't know if it actually how well it will work, but. Um, if we're going to make any adjustments, we're going to do it from this end. But it's also beautifully done so that it's under, it's below the level of this um, scratch plate. So the, the downside of that is that we have to set the um, truss rod before we put the neck back on and hope that we've got about the right amount of relief in it, um, which isn't brilliant. Uh, and f what's good for that is to keep a spare set of strings because um, if we have a spare set of strings, we can put those on. Test the relief in the neck, drop those springs off, change the, uh, the truss rod setting, and then put the, uh, the neck back on and put some plain springs, quality springs back on then. Um, and that way we will have loaded the neck up, but we won't have worn out a set of strings uh, trying to get the, the, uh, the neck relief set right. So it's a little bit annoying. Uh, I'm never quite sure why the what design what rationale there is to putting the <coughs> truss, rod, truss rod adjustment under there. It seems a bit of a, a, silly, uh, a silly move, in my book anyway. So just now I'm going to fire up the soldering iron because as we go through this I want to, um, I want to dis disconnect the scratch plate and take it right off so I can do repairs to the, the lacquer and things like that without having to worry about the um, any of the hardware being on. So, and as I say, I'll need the um, these things off and this unsoldered from the tremolo claw at the back. And I'll take off all of the strap buttons. Just, just literally everything will, will come off this guitar. What I'll also probably end up doing, um, when it comes to it, I'll probably end up uh, cutting those cracks in such a way that I can fill them. <coughs> Excuse me. In, which, in a way that I can first of all check them for structural stability, um, and then, if I need to, I can glue them, and then on top of that, then I can re-fill those cracks and build up some. Um, some lacquer, paint and lacquer around it. So it gives me a chance to gives me a chance to kind of refix it so it it's, doesn't <clears throat> it doesn't look bad and you don't it doesn't feel like it's in danger of breaking any further. So it's stabilizing it if needs be um, and tidying it up. So in taking all of this off um, it's pretty simple you can get everything off in one go. Uh, and I do for the, for the purpose of really getting giving it a good clean. Nothing, nothing better than to have it all as clean as it can be when you put it all back together again. And also, it's a good discipline because it lets me check out every component as I go. And if there are any um, kind of fatal flaws or problems, then I can take care of them. I'm kind of interested on this particular Sun Mustang because I've if you watched any of the videos I, I I like not to just accept uh, things, you know, I'm, I'm fairly critical of people who, who jump on a bandwagon and say, yeah, this kind of this kind of pickup is rubbish. So, you know, I hate all the all every guitar with that kind of pickup I hate because they're rubbish. Somebody told me and I believe it. I don't really like doing that, but yeah, I noticed that I've probably fallen foul of that myself when it comes to this kind of tuner. Now, these are the cheapest kinds of tuner you can get, and they don't feel very good. Um, but if I was being honest, I can't tell you if I really know they're crap. I, I can't be certain they are. So rather than just um, assume that just because they're cheap and because I have a prejudice against them and because I take them off every time, 
and put them in a big jar over there um, and replace them with what I think is better. Um, it just really occurred to me that <clears throat> one of these days I really ought to give them a, a run for their money and not just assume they're, they're complete crap. Because actually I, I, I'm not entirely sure they're as bad as I think they are. I know they, they don't feel that great, but if they do their job, that's the deal. Now this um, this tremolo, uh, this this earth wire that's soldered to the tremolo claw, um, as I'm taking it off, what it allows me to do is just look at the tremolo claw, and that's been <coughs> that's been screwed completely into the uh, into the body of the guitar there, and that's one of the ways. It's probably the best, simplest way that you would lock off a, a tremolo if you don't want to use it. Um, but we could, if we wanted to, <coughs> consider undoing it and using it. Okay, so there's your fairly standard, familiar looking innards of your Sun Mustang, your Indian thing. What's, what's interesting is that on the three that I've had of these so far, the switch has been different every time. So uh, one of them was a much simpler one. It wasn't enclosed, but it had kind of open springs. This one is, um, again, showing the, uh, the March 1990 quality control check signature there but it's very simple and it's very straightforward and there's one um, one little capacitor there um, one tone and two sorry one volume and two tones <coughs> and they're 500k pots so absolutely bog standardy stuff and personally I quite like the tone of these things I don't you know you can invest money and upgrade them but they are kind of nice already they're quite convincing so here we have uh, this hardwood um we've even got some little inscriptions it's got b and l here um i don't know what that stands for but <clears throat> yeah we've we've got a hardwood body and it's quite heavy it's nice and it's it's um reassuringly heavy uh and it's good full thickness full fender thickness and um you can see it's it's <coughs> it's kind of routed quite generically but it's got room for the two different patterns. One of these guitars came with the three single coils, or the HSS configuration is another one, which I've got one of in the house. So anyway, this is uh, going to be hung up now, so I can come back to it when I'm in the mood for doing some polishing uh, and some lacquer repairing, um, and including uh, having a little dig at these cracks and see what what lies underneath. Nice thing about choosing to do that, of course, is if you cracks are so fine that you can't really just paint on top of them with some I don't know whatever uh, black lacquer and then some clear lacquer it just won't work so to fix this you need to dig this out a little bit um, so these hairline things if you want them gone you need to cut down into them like make a trench um, and that's quite deliberate and you can cut right down to the wood or down to the primer or into the wood down to the wood and then you can see whether there's some structural damage and if not then you can fill back outwards <coughs> with black and then go into um, clear lacquer over the top and blend it in so uh, it's quite easy to do <coughs> it just takes a bit of time and it, um, it, it also begs that interesting question that I still haven't found a really really good answer to yet and that is Given, <clears throat> given that these guitar bodies are, these particular guitar bodies, both of them, in fact, this this one from the Sun Mustang uh, and this one from the Korean uh, Korean Squire, which is in fact uh, a laminate. This is definitely a laminate body, and you can see the way. I don't know if you can see the light reflecting, but it's very easy to see the layers of the laminate even through the even a well done. Lacquer. Anyway, both of these undoubtedly will have been done in polyurethane. Um, but I would use, in both cases, I would use uh, nitrocellulose to repair them. And I, you know, I, as I said in another video, I know that a lot of people would probably kind of throw their hands up and gnash their teeth and wail and all of that because it's some sort of sacrilege. Um, but I've not really found a, a substantial reason why not to do it? Certainly not on a budget guitar. I mean, if it was your, if it was your expensive um, 
classic, I wouldn't do it. But on a budget guitar like this, that's you know been around for 20, 30 years, um, or 10 years even, I've not found any undue effects from doing it. So, and I find personally, I find the um, the nitro uh, much easier to use in re for repair than, than the waterborne lacquer, which is the te technically the correct one. So I'm going to freeze this into a little space over on the untidy shelf. And um, while I'm there, I'm going to take out these, uh, get, get these tuners off as well. Although, like I said, half a mind to um, challenging myself a little bit on these and not just assuming they're crap. I mean, in fact, they, they might not be as bad as I prefer to think they are. Still, I've got plenty to choose from. I've got a whole jar of them. And um, also um, with the with this one, uh, the tuners that came off this are reasonably good quality. So I can, if I like, replace. I've got a spare set that I think um, I could replace without having to go to a great expense on this one. Um, now the Sun Mustang, or well, these tuners are, uh, I think they're about a nine millimeter post. And they're just drilled for that diameter, or <clears throat> I think that post is probably seven, and they're drilled to nine. So if you're going to put an, any other kind of, or most any other kind of tuner, you probably have to, uh, I'll probably have to drill these out, which, is, which again is fine. I've got the filler drill um, for doing just that. And you've got to be very careful the way you, um, the way you drill to make sure that you don't get some splitting as the drill comes through the wood. Now, if, when I first did this, I, I made a complete mess of a, of a neck that way. And I guess most people do when they try it for the first time. Um, now, knowing that, of course, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't do anyone's guitar if I was going to kind of splinter their neck every time I uh, came to fit some decent tuners. Um, what I did was... Um, I bought myself a one of these 60 70 pound pillar drills which are so cheap but they're actually great um they, they give you sort of vertical stability but actually i found the thing that really makes the most difference um on whether you splinter wood or not is the material that's directly underneath this piece when you do the drilling so you can even do a hand drill uh, the danger with the hand drill is you can't be as exact but providing this piece is supported by a good block of wood that you can drill straight into uh, it stops the um, splintering that happens, not all together, not 100%, but mostly, and, and it means you can get fairly clean holes. It's quite tricky, a hand drill, the danger of a hand drill is if, you, if you're just making a hole in a fresh piece of wood, a hand drill is quite easy to use and you can, as I say, you can avoid the kind of exit hole splintering by holding this really tightly down or having it clamped down. The problem, I guess, with a hand drill for most people is going into an existing hole with a hand drill is really, really difficult because the, either the drill wants to snatch and it digs into this hole and, and goes off sideways or the piece wants to move. Um, so you, with a hand drill, you, you would really struggle to drill a clean, uh, a larger oval, uh, you know, to increase the ball of that hole. <clears throat> and that's why I think even if you're mighty confident about your drilling skills, I always I'd recommend have a pillar drill. And they're so cheap these days that you, you know, it'd be crazy not to have one. Now with this, uh, just looking for bits of foam that I've left or moved around somewhere. I'm going to knock out those, um, I don't know what they're called, can't remember, you know, these things. Yes, them. Anyway, I'm going to knock those out. So I just want to support this neck a little bit. I'm going to use myself a... I tend not to use a hammer, strangely enough. I, I prefer a soft handled thing like this. And I've got a, an Allen key that will drive out these things. 
whatever they're called, I keep forgetting. So they, they're quite stiff, but they will come out. And I guess you've got to support your neck or your headstock so that the support block is directly underneath this area because you don't want any flex when you're driving when you're striking this. That's what will cause the, the real damage. If, you know, even better if you had two pieces of this, which right this second I do. Um, it just allows it, and that's not the right size, but you know, just just gives it some support. And there's a word for these. You know what they are? String thingies. Okay, one more. Again, just want to try and support it as much as possible. That one isn't really doing any good at all. I'll put it folded over, that's better. There you go. <clears throat> so we've driven those out, taking care all the while. Which leaves us with a, a, a neck ready to go. It has a, a nut, plastic nut in here, which when we come to take these out and do the... Uh, what I'm thinking about, what did I say? I was thinking about re-radiusing it. Um, then we'd need to take that nut out as well. So I'm just going to put all these bits in the same pot. Uh, while, while I'm at it, um, it's interesting to note at this point the kind of uh, the measurements or the the vital statistics of this this block here. The tremolo block on these guitars uh, is unfortunately a little bit weedy. Um, that's a shame. It's, it is on <clears throat> it is on modern squires as well. There are some guitars that I get through here that are, oh, are have a much heavier and more substantial steel or better quality steel block and a heavier one, and that in, in, is good for improving the. Um, improving the um, sustain. So if if you can or you want to upgrade a guitar then you probably could do a lot worse than to buy 20 pounds, 25 pound decent quality heavy steel um, tremolo bridge for, for a strap guitar like this. Okay so I'm just looking and thinking to myself what am I going to do with this? I've got two of these two of these things. I know this one uh, is in it's, it's pretty good condition it's from the, the Squire uh, Korean Strat which which comes in at a that's a 12 inch radius okay um, for which I ordered these 12 inch frets um, so I'm not going to re-radius that one but I looked at the I looked at the um, the Sun Mustang and I thought well it's got to be refretted, and I've got quite a few um, frets. So what should we do with it? Well, having a look, it's not a nine; even it's a twelve as well. Okay, in fact, it's slightly off twelve. Um, uh, probably because it's so old now. Uh, I'm using the this call, this insert. So basically, this this is not even twelve. It's in fact, it's a bit flatter than twelve, which is quite surprising. So I I'd like to turn it into something else. Let's look. That, that's nearly, that in fact is a 16 inch, practically, that is a 16 inch radius, which is really unusual. I'm sure the rest of the Sun Mustangs aren't that radius. Anyway, um, the nice thing is, is I have some options here because above me I have a radius block. You can get these in any radius you like, but I happen to have 7.25 from a, another job I did. I also have quite a few 7 point, a couple of sets of 7.25 frets and that means actually I can choose to reshape this um, this neck into a 7.25, a much more classic old style um, fender radius and, and I think I'm going to do that uh, and, in, and in doing that then I'm, I'm going to end up with a kind of more curved neck, plain neck. So, Either which way, <clears throat> it's my choice. I can do what I like. Um, yeah, like I said, this this other one, the, the Korean one, 
is a, is a 12, and that's pretty much spot on a 12 actually. The, this one, surprisingly, that it's even flatter than a 12, um, but the Koreans, the Koreans are 12. So I'm just going to refret with 12. I do need to do a bit of surface preparation here, and I don't have a radius block of that size to do that with, so I'm going to have to do it very carefully by hand. Um, you can see it's a very dark. Let's put the light on for this. See what happens with a bit of extra, a bit of extra bounced light. Whoa! It's a very, very old-looking dark rosewood, um, and perhaps next on my shopping list will be a 12-inch radius. Um, but right now, I don't have that, so I'm probably just going to do this light sanding by hand and. and the objective will be to just take down these little ridges where the glue and grime has built up and the, the, the slightly crinkled edges where the, the old frets have been in but it's it is a um it is a consistent radius it's not it doesn't change anywhere along the way so we know we can just work with straight 12 inch radius frets as i say this one is it's greater than 12 inch um, but it's not well it looked like it was a 16 but that's that's pretty amazingly flat for a guitar like this so um, I'm going to definitely re-radius this one and have some fun doing it with this block here. So let me just, oh, I've got used to this now, I'll keep this on, probably won't last very long. Okay, so uh, I've got all my bits and pieces, I'm going to get this out of the way, we'll come and clean that later on as well, so that's going to go and sit on top of the part with all the box wall bits in it. Um, oh, both of these have got to have the nuts removed, so I need to make sure that I've got uh, nuts to go in there, which I don't think I have in terms of black ones at the moment. But the first thing I've got to do is I'm going to do the process of removing the frets from this one. Um, so I'm just going to prop my soldering iron up there, and I'm going to find the correct grippers or pinchers or whatever they call nippers or something, I don't know. And these, this is a special pair of pliers for pulling frets. I've got Morris wanting to come and join us. I'm going to go on to my slightly close up y specs because I want to have a really close look at this as I'm doing it. Now, so that these frets are pushed in um, and possibly glued in place, but actually the slots on this look exactly the same height as the, uh, the fret tang itself which means there isn't any room to put glue into it unless it was uh, in the slot and squeezed out and just holds it in the last bit but these are definitely flat these frets and that's why they don't feel very good to play so what i'm going to do is i'm going to start the process of removing them and to do that i'm not really sure the bestest of ways to do this but um we, we need to start with this pliers and we need a soldering iron we need to be in a comfortable position because what we want to do is we don't want to burn the fretboard uh, and I'm going to look to warm up the, the, the fret in such a way that it will melt any glue that's in there but I don't want to burn the slot so I've got to be kind of careful with this and when I think it's got a bit warmed up I'm going to try and just pinch under the end of this fret now I've uh, found before this is actually quite hard to do with one hand and then the other. You need to hold this thing firmly um, just to get it right. Sometimes you need to hold this tool with two hands. So I'm just getting it warmed up to begin with. And what I'm going to do is as soon as I've got it warmed up at that end, I'm going to put the uh, soldering iron down and I'm going to use that to I'm going to get myself a bite under that fret. And that's fine, it's got that one. And I'm going to do the same thing all the way along until I've got a little start point on each fret. And then I'm going to go back and gently warm up and take each fret out. Um, and I found in the past where if you're rushing and you try and do this with one hand and that with the other hand, what tends to happen is you can end up biting a chunk out of the metal of the fret but not actually getting a good start point. And that starts to make things quite difficult because um, if you... No, it's not a very good position for this sort of thing. If you... Uh, If you chop out all of this metal before you, without getting a little bite into it or getting it lifting, then you've not got much to hold on to the next time you try it. So, a little piece of advice, put this soldering iron down, just, the fret will stay warm enough for a little bit longer 
for you to hold the thing and then do the thing. You can usually smell the uh, whether it's a glue or just the wood underneath, it starts to smell a little bit and tells you you're heating it up quite nicely. Now this is, this. I'm going to do something else with this uh, soldering iron because it's not a sensible place for it to be. The cable's pulling it. Now this is probably a bit better. At least it will stay where I want it to be. So it, it is one of those things that you really must take the time to get this, get yourself in, in the right position. Don't go rushing off until the environment's right for you. Hello, Morris. You don't want to come up on here while I'm doing this, Morris, because you run the risk of getting burned by a soldering iron at best. Okay, now I've got four of these just lifted and I'm not gonna make you wait throughout the whole thing. So I'll show you is just how I lift uh, the remain or the rest of the whole one and then I'll switch the video off and um, come back when we've got this all off. Now th this, actually what I'm going to do is while I'm here, I'm going to gently clamp this down at this end. Morris, 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 don't do this. Soldering iron out of the way, Morris out of the way. You really, really, really <clears throat> don't want to get your fur singed, Morris. You stay there. Okay. So I'm just going to lightly uh, fix this guitar neck here. And then it's not a real massive. Um, not a huge amount of force, but it'll allow me to, um, to get on with this job without the whole thing moving too far around. So, thank you. So the idea is one hand uh, using the, the nippers and I'm going along just gently warming the fret and you can see I'm doing a little bit of rocking uh, with the nippers, not too much, but I'm, I'm doing it. You can either press down and squeeze if you want, that does the same effect. It will. It will uh, kind of lever the fret loose and uh, allow you to pull it. Okay, and then you just sort of bite your way to the end, really, um, and resist the temptation to hoik out the last one, the last bit, because um, your objective is to bring it out with as little damage to the, um, the fretboard as possible. And then I'm going to just do one more, and then I'll switch off, and I'll get to listen to some Radio Four and. By the miracle of video, I'll suddenly appear back with you. Now, of course, the reason I'm doing this is because I have a proper press over there um, set up to make it fairly easy for me, pretty easy for me, to refret this kind of Stratocaster neck. Um, I can, I can use, I can do bolt-on necks pretty easily. Uh, it gets much more tricky when it comes to refretting a, or more tricky when it comes to refretting a glued neck guitar. Um, and it becomes even trickier still when it comes to refretting a, an acoustic guitar. Um, because you've got to get, you've got to be able to get into the sound hole and underneath the fingerboard inside the sound hole to support um, using your fret press. Okay, so I'll stop at that point, um, the, stop the video anyway, and so you can see that's the first three frets out and uh, my soldering iron still wants to go for a walk. I'll just stick it around there again. Um, yeah, first three out and there's no damage to the fingerboard and uh, it's ready for me to kind of gently clean that up. Well, actually I'll clean it up by re-radiusing this one. So I'll get all of these out get this nut out, we'll re-radius the whole thing with sandpaper and the um, radius thingy um, and then we'll cut <clears throat> cut the slots again to make sure they're clean and empty and the right depth and then we'll be ready 
on this neck anyway to um, press in new frets with probably with a bit of glue that's what I did before and it seems to work okay okay so let me put a stop on this and see you in a minute well so here we are <clears throat> stuck into the uh, re-radiusing this Sun Mustang <clears throat> so it's going to be a slightly custom-y guitar and it's really nice to see all this uh, rosewood coming up and we're not far off actually from being ready to uh, re reset the slots When, uh, when I took the nut off this, a chunk of the um, little bit of the rosewood came off here, so I've had to glue it back on. But it's holding together okay. So I think we're down at, uh, the, down at the seven and a quarter inch radius down here. But we've still got some distance to go on the, the rest of the board. So I'm going to keep battling away. And we're just starting to slice some of the tops off the, uh, the markers here, which is okay. Kind of not far off all round actually. So you can just basically see some uncut bits in the centre of the board which has not been cut down yet. Uh, and we'll get to that at this end any minute now. amazing when you do this the edges of the fretboard suddenly become incredibly sharp the way they never were before because obviously you're, you're making them sort of precise again um, okay I'm just gonna keep going I'm using quite a heavy uh, major league uh, paper here I'm using 80 to begin with because I've got a lot a lot of material to take off um, and there's no point being too gentle about it. Uh, I've got to get there. And then when we get right down there, we'll switch over to uh, finer grade just to kind of go in and uh, finish it off. We're nearly there, just a little bit of shine in the middle there. It was the ends that are hardest to get going because you don't get the same great cut or pressure as the other um, parts but we're just on it there right so so I'm, God, it's really really good and there's a little gap there where it's worn down a little bit um, and I'll take a bit more down there as well no you, you need to make sure we get all of it done uh, since it's kind of brand new refreshed board the uh, rosewood in my nose in my mouth almost there I'll take off these sharp edges before I cut myself badly um, <coughs> again just a quick wipe and you can you can see the bits that aren't quite right but I'm going to see if I can do those with a, uh, a less ruthless piece of paper and um, I'll go to, to a jump to a 600 that's a bit too much of a jump in one go I've got to obviously shake out all of this in a little while because it's got some dust everywhere now I'll hold that off for a second and then I'm just going to want some <coughs> a little bit a one piece of 240 
just do a couple of bit passes of 240 and then the 600 um, and then we go to some some uh, micro mesh just to sort of really polish it up a little bit now. Round and see if I can get the pressure on this end evenly. That's not bad, I think we've just about, just about touched everything there. And a tiny little bit of old fingerboard just peeking through at the end here where probably worn down through uh, use over time but pretty much that's all done and that and that's re-radius now to uh, to a seven and a quarter inch and then I'm just gonna go over I'll do a one more a couple more blasts with this I'll spin it so we can This will be noticeable in the sense that you'll see the white position markers. You can see them just protruding uh, into the, the frets themselves. But, you know, it's a, it's a minor, small price to pay for uh, having a completely renewed set of frets. I'm just going to now soften off these edges. Actually, I'm probably a bit ahead of the game here because I suspect I'm going to put the sharp bits right back on again. But yeah, it's more um, more touchable. Okay, so that's 240. I'm going to do <coughs> a little bit of 600 just to smooth it out, and then switch to to the uh, micro mesh. Lovely to see reconditioned wood. It's such a pretty sight. Such a rich luster. And then when as you as you start to get a bit of a shine in it now, you start to see the, the different veins of colour going up and down it. And obviously it gets even more visible when you put oil on uh, the finer you go with the paper. Okay, I'm just going to use, put some of these straight, uh, straight onto it. And I'm not sure this doesn't fit perfectly well now, so I might be struggling a little bit. But hopefully, I won't scratch it with the wood. Um, it's just really. I, I could do this without the radius block, I suppose, but I just want to, I don't want to, having taken care of the, the shape now, I don't want to um, make it any way uneven by just doing it carelessly by hand. Okay. Good thing about those micro meshes, you can actually wash them when you need to, so I think mine are, uh, mine are probably due a dip, and that gets out a lot of the... Uh, the stuff that clogs up the pores. As I say, you can you can absolutely see now that the side position markers are showing through on the fingerboard. Um, but that's you know it's the price you pay for tidying up, or reshaping the fingerboard, cleaning it up, and giving it some <coughs> a new radius and new frets. So when I get down to this sort of level, I might switch to using my hand now to um, shine this last bit up because I want I want to get a coverage. Uh, it doesn't. It's not taking away much in the way of uh, material, so I can afford to um, much more afford to run, run it with my hand. 
just to make, them, make sure I, I get the edges as well. Um, that's messy, I know. The thing is about these micro meshes is that if you wanted to, they can um, you can pretty much end up with a shine, right, right up to a shine with these. They're so effective. I can, I can see where there's some of the old uh, wear on the fretboard still showing through. Um, that's what you get with age, I guess. So this will this will be lovely when it's got some new frets on there. a bit of a little bit more taking off the edges so I'm just gonna gently do that at around 1800 I think just to make sure I'm not gonna go all the way over a fingerboard because I don't want to I, mean, I don't have to go through all of it again but it's just softening off the very sharp edge Okay, so we've got two necks nearly ready. The, um, we've still got the nut from this one. It came, it took a bit of the wood with it, but it came, the nut came off pretty well. Um, so I'm gonna tidy up a little bit here because this is now a filthy mess. Dust everywhere. Um, yeah, re-radiused. So that will take a 7.25 now. Um, and it's also therefore made the, the neck a little bit thinner generally. Um, change, it changes it slightly, not a huge amount. Push these off to one side for a minute. We might need some more of that. Right, so that was, that was the fun of re-radiusing. And just for, for fun, it's not crucial at the moment, but I'm going to put a drop of oil into this for a second, just so we can see what it scrubs up like in the end. Obviously I'm going to rub most of it off the surface because I want to um, make sure the frets stay in. But just as a, a visual, that's, the, that's a nice re-finished, fresh fretboard. Again, as I say, the dot's slightly overrunning into the um, into the, the, the fingerboard itself, but you know, that's, a, that's the price we have to pay for re-radiusing. And then uh, we come back to this one, which is just a little bit cleaned up, um, but by, by comparison, it's uh, we haven't done as much resurfacing there. It's pretty much it's certainly the same dimensions as it was, but again, it's nice and dark and rich and. Some, some fresh frets on top of that will be really nice. That's pretty much ready to go, that one. Um, this one, I need to take a bit of time uh, now to make sure that the frets, the fret slot is the right, uh, the right dimensions or the right depth because obviously we've taken the, the surface radius down. Um, let's see. That's quite interesting. It's slightly over that radius because of the way we've worked it. Because um, the paper sort of sticks up at the edges. So, so we'll need to kind of press hard with our six inch call, but that will work. Um, so what we've got is the slots, which I'm now going to need. I'm going to put some guide paper on here because we've got, we've got a um, bit of cleaning to do. Uh, Go, go down to the sort of level that we were at before because they've already been cut once but we, we clean out the slots completely and then we probably need to do a little bit work either side so I'm just going 
horizontally across to make sure these slots are free of all dust and former glue and stuff like that. So it's just a kind of an initial clean through to start with. Um, and then there'll be a bit of following the radius to do. Um, <coughs> oh, it's dusty. And uh, you can feel the, the glue on the edge of some of this still. We're, we're kind of cutting into that a little bit. <coughs> so we need to get a flat cut first. Um, and that means taking a bit of this glue out. Um, and then we'll come back and just round off so that we know that we're, broadly speaking, we're following the contour or the radius of the guitar. It isn't going to be perfect, um, but as long as it accepts the tang of the fret, and, the, and we may also want a bit of room underneath for, the, uh, for some glue to go in, if that's what we want to do. That's the main thing. And you can see, it's, you may be able to see, it's quite a bit of goo that's gone in there. There's some little chips as well, there's one little chip there that's loose, come loose and jumped out, but... Uh, I don't think... I don't think we can put it back on. I think it's had its, <coughs> had its day. Anyway. Right, let's get the, at least the blade in the right place. Right, so after this part of the process, I'm going to, I'll go through it again with the slightly wider uh, file and, and just curve the edges and then we'll be ready to get something to eat and then after that it will be a case of um, starting to just glue, press and glue frets in um, and we can get as many as we can get done fairly quickly. I don't want to rush it and make a mistake but I'm also keen to do it fairly uh, quickly um, part, in part because uh, it's sort of doing this, doing this at the cost, rather than any, getting anything out of it financially. Because you know it's been, um, it's something that has had to be done because of the condition that, that it came in. Right. So I'm just going to look visually at this and see. Uh, what we've got. And these do need to go down a little bit, so make sure I've got the right end of these saws. Again, this isn't, I'm not doing this hugely precisely. You could do, you could put a little, uh, what's the word, a little guide paper guide or masking tape guide on there, um, possible good thing to do, um, and then you know just keep a real close eye that you're not going too far, but I'm doing this by eye, uh, it seems to be going alright. And again the idea is to just make sure that I've got enough depth in these slots to accept the new frets comfortably. Uh, as I say, it will chip off any loose bits of um, thingy me jig uh, rosewood and to be honest unless you're dealing with a brand new guitar or something and you're going to catch every single new every single little piece and try and glue it back on in some painstaking thing then it's quite uh, difficult you have to accept that you're going to get some chipping going on around these Particularly, actually, in this part of the process, I mean, it may have been smart, I suppose, to have cut these slots even deeper to begin with, but in some ways, until you've re-radius, you don't really know how much deeper they need to be. Um, because it's uh, sort of, 
flying, plane flying a bit. <laughs> Live and learn. Remembering these are nut slot files, so they're not brilliant. They're not absolutely perfect for frets, um, and it may take a couple of trials to find out if it's steep enough, or whether we have to go and cut some, dig some more. be a bit of trial and error but we'll push one in and, and see what happens. So this takes a bit of time. Warm now because this thing is pumping it out. The Morris is enjoying it. So I was watching, uh, and I don't know his name, but I heard him mention his name, but I can't bloody remember what it was. Uh, Woody So's channel the other day, Canadian guy who's setting up or doing guitar work and um, he's currently experimenting with uh, what, finding out what a, a lacquered rosewood fingerboard plays like or looks like or performs like. Um, it's quite interesting because obviously it's it's not common, um, in fact you almost never see that. Uh, plenty of maple uh, fretboards that are lacquered but no rosewood ones and again it's one of those old things that it's really funny he, he makes that suggestion and then gets sort of screamed at by lots of people um, of people who seem to think they know what's good and should and shouldn't be done um, but I've, I've still not seen much of an argument uh, that sort of explains to me the position on why not. Um, but the only thing that stuck in my memory is somebody said something about there being natural oils or something, more natural oils or more oil in the rosewood neck and therefore uh, presumably they thought the um, they thought lacquer would struggle to stay on. Um, now I, I don't have a can't say either either which way to be honest. I have no idea. Um, I guess the good thing is that Woody So's trying to uh, trying it out. Whoa! There goes my overloaded camera. Yeah, he's just trying it out to uh, to have a see how it works. And um, let's put a bit of extra light on here. You know, so if it if it works, then great. He's proved it. And if it doesn't. He's not lost anything but an old affinity guitar neck or some such. Um, but it's just like so many of these things that so there are a lot of viewpoints, but I, nobody's nobody seems to put forward a very strong argument. Um, a lot of passion and belief, uncertainty about the way things should or shouldn't be done. But as I say, not not a huge amount of. Um, yeah, convincing argument as to why the case behind these things. So, who knows? We shall see. I quite like the fact that he's um, willing to experiment in that way. Um, although, you, you know, it seems like on YouTube or in this thing of doing guitars, you've got to be a bit thick skinned if you're going to do that because you do get shot down or attacked pretty quickly. And I know that from watching another couple of his posts, I know for sure that he's been. He's been quite affected and hurt by some of the nasty comments that he's uh, attracted or people have put on his site. So, it's 
it's a shame that you know that if you do something that's different and you, you want to know find out for yourself that it should attract any negativity you know, the, the internet seems to be such that it is full of strong views but can be light on convincing uh, arguments to support those views and um, I, I need to see an argument um, like him you know like the thing I was saying a bit earlier about uh, doing repairs on polyurethane lacquer with um, with uh, nitro, you know, and the somehow you start with the feeling that oh you're transgressing here, um, and that somebody's going to come along and tell you how stupid you are, uh, and yet you know you may you may hold a very strong belief that I'm stupid for doing that, but if you tried to see it from my point of view, then you might realise that. Well, how would I, how would I know one way or another? Since there is so little in the way of comprehensive supporting argument to, to, that I can use to judge, um, and, and funnily enough, I, you know, maybe just be, um, may say that I'm not very good at searching, but I have searched high and low, and I cannot find a single meaningful statement that says, "Hey, you can or cannot use <laughs> nitro." Uh, cellulose to repair uh, poly because this or that will or won't happen. I just cannot find that information. Um, I wonder if, if it is because everybody sh shies away from doing it because there there is no answer out there and if you go out to do it you'll get shot down and if you go and try and experiment to be the person who at least provides an answer of some uh, quality that somebody else can at least learn from, then you also get shot down because you're, you're behaving transgressively. So I think that if that's the way the internet's becoming, I think that's pretty depressing because that's, that's anti-learning. Um, and instead of being this wide open place of discovery, you know, what we've got is a really conservative uh, conservative and dangerous world in which if you, if you question the sort of comfortable accepted norms you get far worse, treated far worse than actually you would if you did it in a classroom or a university lecture hall. Hello. Oh, thank you. <sighs> I know. Yeah, he's, he's lucky. Look, I've re-profiled, taken a few little chips off the fingerboard, but that's what the price you pay. It's a different shade, but it's also some of these now bleed through, those are the markers. But, that's the price of thinning it down. Yeah, but there's, there's, there's enough there, isn't there? Oh yeah, that's more than enough to yeah. take the frets. Right, let's put a stop on this. <laughs> Hey, good morning everybody. Welcome to the Real Love Guitars workshop. Just um, doing a few little bits and pieces this morning. Um, but I've been remiss because I've done some <coughs> some work on these two necks. Um, the Squire Korean Stratocaster and also the um, Sun Mustang. And I sort of progressed these last night without really videoing them. So uh, there'll be a a missing chunk on uh, on the video, <clears throat> but my my excuse for doing it is that I just needed a bit of brain off time where I wasn't videoing. And anyway, you deserved a break. Um, so these now are both of these are now ready to polish, and that's just going to be you know uh, a bit of hard work that I've got to do now. I'll, I'll get started and I'll talk through the start of the process, but then I'll probably stop again. Uh, so I can just do it you know, with a radio on or something. It's, it's going to be too boring to watch me doing these things. Um, also, alongside of that, what I'm just doing here is I'm I'm just finishing off uh, some repairs to um, these two wonderful guitars, the Korean plywood Strat um, body, and also the Sun Mustang. I'm just going to 
add a little bit to this. Um, I'm just doing some painted on lacquer repairs and what I've done is where the neck uh, pocket has hairline cracks I've dug into them, checked that they don't go into the wood, made sure it's structurally safe uh, and then I've done a little bit of paint and then I've done some um, painted lacquer, several la layers and then I've um, sanded uh, and then lacquered again. So this is now pretty much, I'm going to leave this to dry all week and then I'll be able to sand that up and polish it. So that's that one done. And so I'm just going to leave this hanging here for the rest of that week and um, it will be ready for final polish out and when it's done it'll look pretty good. Um, and it's nice to be able to do that. <clears throat> As I say, you know, sometimes you get these guitars and people sell them without declaring the state of the neck pocket, which is really annoying. Um, so you have to go and embark on a repair, which costs time, not really money, but time, um, which is money. But anyway, um, yeah, it's just a bit annoying, but it's satisfying. Even if I lose out a bit on it, it's very satisfying to get it back into you know a good shape that um, somebody would be happy to own or play. Anyway, here's, here's, a, here's the Sun Mustang body at a slightly earlier stage. And you can see I'm just I've been building up some of the black paint or cellulose paint into there. Um, and then what I'm just doing is taking the, uh, the sticky out bits. I need a bit of a stronger material. Uh, just taking back some of the, um, removing some of the excess on there. And then uh, once that's dried, then I will go over that with the clear and start building that back up again so that we have a nice uh, smooth finish to work with at the end and you know this is uh, it's very satisfying as I say to be able to do it because you know it takes these guitars from guitars that you'd be disappointed to get if you bought this thing and you, it turned up and you found it had cracks and the seller hadn't told you and it would be a real disappointment and it turns it from that into you know guitars that you know you can be sure that's had cracks but it's also been looked after and put put back uh, into a nice condition and again both of these um on both of these guitars the crack doesn't the cracks don't go anywhere <sighs> significant um they're not major structural cracks i mean i don't I don't doubt for one minute that they originate in the wood because I'm not one of these people who thinks that the, the lacquer just splits on its own. Although, you know, there are a lot of people that argue very strongly that it's about uh, the wood expanding, so on and so on, um, and then the lacquer being more rigid and therefore um, kind of cracking because it can't expand at the same rate as the wood. Who knows? What I do know is that... Um, what I, I always want to do is make sure that it's not anything that I need to worry about in terms of structural damage. Um, so as I say, it's a matter of just taking these back to smooth um, and then we'll go over it with clear lacquer and then that will be left to dry over the week along with that one. Um, and then I'll come back next week and um, basically um, polish those areas out with, with finer and finer paper until we end up with a, a smooth smooth shine um, and that that will then be able to be polished with micro mesh papers until we're almost shining again and then uh, once that's done then we'll go with some polishing creams and uh, it might never be absolutely mirror smooth but it will be um, pretty pretty good and it's not something you will notice or um, spoil the guitar in any way so yeah it's just a you know paying it that extra bit of care to get it right so as far as I'm concerned there's enough paint in one side of this that's okay it's this side here is a bit still got a bit of a gap but again we can fill it with clear lacquer rather than put more paint the paint is more of a uh, sometimes it's a filler if it's a big hole 
but sometimes it's it's just very good as a um, a colorant, you know, to to cover wood or cover primer. Um, and so long as it's covered, then I can level or fill a bit more with the clear lacquer, which either either does the job um, in that sense. So I put this on quite thick um, because I can. Um, I really can't see there, but I'm putting it on quite thick. And the reason I do that is that I want it to settle into a relatively, um, gravity will pull it into a rel relatively smooth finish, um, which I will then uh, sand down again um, over the next day or so while I'm um, doing other things. And then once I've done that, then I'll leave it f for the whole week. Um, and it will be beautifully smooth by the time I finish it. So it's quite, not clumsy, it's quite, you know, hands-on. Uh, I could, I've got plenty of spray lacquer, I could be trying to mask all this off and spray it, but you know, this is this is a, a budget guitar, you know, it's getting a new lease of life, and it's about, you know, will it last, is it strong? Um, it's never, it's never, this guitar, if you can, you can see all the scratches, it's never going to be so I'm going to pretend to be a new guitar again. So, um, but what we we have is we've got a guitar with a new set of frets, a reconditioned neck. It's like better than new actually because it's got no uneven frets. Um, uh, you know, and these cracks taken care of around the neck pocket so that um, you know it's going to last a lot longer. Another twenty years of happy playing. So. This one I'm not going to hang back up, I'm just going to prop somewhere out of the way because I want to add a few layers to this during the day. <clears throat> the question is right now is where have I got any spare room that isn't going to get dust on it. So you know what, I'll contradict what I just said and I will hang it up. If anything just to keep it out of the way of all the dust. As out of the way as possible. It's not going to be totally possible. Right. <clears throat> So those two are coming towards completion, and it seems like a lot of fiddly work, um, but it's it's all worthwhile because there'll be a point at which it suddenly all goes back together again, um, and we'll suddenly have two nice guitars ready, getting ready to be listed <coughs> on eBay. That's, a, that's the thing about doing this. It seems like the, the, the fiddling about goes on for a long, long time until all of a sudden. It's how we've got suddenly got more guitars around the house <clears throat> ready to ready to get sold. Um, now with these necks, now I'm just going to get myself some sandpaper ready for this part of the process, <coughs> and um, what I'm looking to do is just get some strips of two different gauges in this case. I'm going to use, as always, uh, 240 and 600. It's not exact, I and mean, it could be, could be 320 and <clears throat> 800. It doesn't really matter. It's just one fairly tough and one uh, finer ga gauge or grade. So here we have the 600s, and then we have the 240s here, which is distinctly. Um, thingy, scratchy, and we're going to do the same thing on both necks, so uh, I'm going to just do it, film it once, or film most of it once, and um, and then the idea is I'll just use both of these bits of video on each video for the guitar, if you get what I'm saying. Um, okay, so the, the, the routine behind this is the same as ever, the logic is, is um, straightforward. Having done fret levelling uh, and reprofiling, re we've we levelled with this tool, which has got huge, big scratches, and um, we reprofiled with this tool, which leaves 300 grit, which is quite a lot finer than this. But the ones we're really bothered about are the longitudinal scratches on the top of the frets left by this tool, so we'll ignore this one for now. So that's our enemy, and the purpose of this next part of the process is to polish these frets um, using 240 until we reach a point where there's no more evidence of these scratches at all. Then, and only then, um, 
and it's really important we don't move on so I'm going to do a bit of close scrutiny. Then and only then we move on to the 600 and we keep going until we then go through a series of micro mesh papers until we've got a, um, a really fine shine at which point we're going to do a Dremel run over as a final piece. <clears throat> but the critical thing in all of this is making sure the bit that can ruin it is if we move onwards and leave any of these scratches in the top of the frets and it's impossible to see with the naked eye so we have to use a, uh, a magnifying glass to, to, to make sure we haven't and we have to be really disciplined about it because it's very easy to just want to get to the end of it and move on and while the frets can look really good there can still be traces of that um, that uh, fret leveling file and while there are still traces of that fret leveling file in the scratches at the top of the fret then what will happen is we'll end up with um, when you put all the strings on put, reassemble the guitar and then try and play it you'll get you'll feel the scratchiness under the strings and it'll be horrible so this is really important to get it right um, and that takes a bit of discipline I suppose um, and a bit of rigor uh, put this somewhere it isn't going to fall down on me straight away Okay, so um, just to start this off, um, what we do is I'm going to use my hands, fingers, and I'm just going to go up and over the top of these frets, um, pressing downwards, because what I want is I want this 240 to remove those um, scratches, the big heavy scratches, but I, I want the paper to ride up and over the frets. I don't want it to create a flat spot, because it's already flat, um, and it's really critical that we this process rounds the frets back off as much as possible and it's also really important that all the frets get the same amount of treatment as each other um, because this paper is capable of lowering these frets quite quickly um, and if we don't make sure that they all get the same treatment then you recreate uneven spots and that sort of would defeat the whole object of doing this in the first place so I'm just conscious all the way, trying to make sure that everything gets about the same amount of uh, attention. Now I know from experience that the first few and the last, first and last frets are the ones that usually end up with some of these marks on them, because it's somehow it's easy to ignore them, and the ones in the middle get done really well, and the ones at the edges uh, yeah, end up with marks still on them. So I'm, I am doing a little bit extra attention on the first and last frets, um, but not staying there too long so that I reduce them too much by comparison with the ones all around them. I'm just trying to counter the natural tendency to, to miss them out. Okay, so one piece of paper used up. And uh, I'll probably brush off the dust down near the ground to try and keep most of it out of my nose and lungs. Um, I'm not going to examine it yet, I'm just going to keep on going. It takes at least two of these sheets to get this done, and sometimes three. Now I'm noticing that this is uh, rubbed off the uh, masking tape at the end so as soon as you notice that happening just grab some more tape and chuck it on as much as you need to safeguard the fingerboard it's kind of considerate priceless you've you got masking tape I pay £1.10 per roll um, and the fingerboard is a lot more expensive so it makes sense to take care of the fingerboard and sacrifice the masking tape <coughs> Sometimes one of the reasons why this end doesn't get, this one, last couple don't get done is because there's a nut there and sometimes it's, um, I find myself sort of stopping before I run over the top of the nut because I don't want to damage the nut. But sort of a natural tendency to hold off when you get to this end. OK, 
okay a bit more and then we'll be not far off doing a check now as I said I'm putting both the same video on both guitars but you can see that this is the process that's gone on for both of them um, no different they're just the, the fret sizes are slightly different the the ones on the other neck they're uh, a, uh, on the Sun Mustang they're a vintage um, 7.25 radius so they're finer these are a bit more jumbo okay now this is the bit that really matters um, and I'll put my goggles on and get friendly with the uh, magnifying glass and I'm going to mark up if I see any of these scratches remaining I'm going to mark them up because I want this to be as good as it can possibly be and uh, going forward with any of these longitudinal scratches isn't going to be um, isn't going to make for a nice result a, a little technique I found a while back is before I do the check it's just to run counter to the direction that I've been sanding in with a very fine paper like a 2000 and what that does is it sort of breaks up the clears the surface off first of all so I'm not mistaking anything but it also changes the, the light pattern I'm getting a blister here changes the way the light reflects off it and it makes it easier for me to spot the um, if there are still uh, scratches of the size I'm worried about still remaining on here now I'm not worried about the scratches from the 240 paper that's what I want to see on there what I don't want to see are any residual scratches from the um, the fret leveling file which was that big rough rather unsophisticated device that we used to uh, take the tops off the frets in the first place right so I would say I've got a tiny bit there I'm just gonna mark it up for good measure absolutely minuscule I can't even show you on this thing but uh, what I can tell you is there's a slight point there and there's one on two frets down Oh, sorry. Um, and that's all that all I know now is that I need to do another another pass with another sheet but we're not far off um, yeah, there's one I think there's one on there no that was a piece of dust sometimes that can fool you as well and get down to this end and this is usually the end where I leave some yeah there's one right on the last one okay so you know there's a bit of one more to do and I can judging by what I've seen now I can be pretty confident that one pass now with the 240 will do it and I'm gonna switch because my finger is getting a blister yeah. I'm gonna switch to this um, sculpted or carved block and I'm gonna use that to just make sure I take up all of these little scratches now um, and you can see it's just the same sort of thing I'm going to pay attention to that. I'm not going to loiter there too long, but wherever I've marked it up, I've, I've, I've got to make sure that, that those marks are gone, including this last one here. But I, I know now from, from experience that this will be enough to take care of those marks. There's so few that we're almost there. And it's just this attention to detail that will make sure your, um, your newly fretted neck is not only level, but it's also beautifully smooth and be a pleasure to play. Um, you know, don't think for one minute that you can just uh, put in a series of a, a set of new frets and that's, your, that's it, off you go. You've got to do all of this leveling and polishing too, because uh, as I said before, no new set of frets will be leveled by itself. Now on this, um, on this neck, we know that because these frets are new, and we know that this guitar um, is just literally 
installed them myself that there's probably a tendency for the edges to be a little bit sharp I've done most all pretty much taken away all the sharpness but it doesn't hurt to add an extra run down the sides to give these the smoothest possible finish you can have right so as far as I'm concerned that's the, the 240 done and my in, inner quality controller says because we got rid of all those scratches from the uh, horrible but effective fret leveling file we can now move on to the lighter grade of um, paper and I would recommend two or three of these now we're not going to not going to bother checking from here on because the, the, the scratches we're now going to replace are the 240 scratches and we're going to replace it with 600 and they're very very fine to the eye and you'd struggle to see the difference between those and the 240 so this is a case of just sticking it out giving it the time it needs making sure all these frets get a good going over and I would use two or three sheets of this to do it and the way this the first paper makes sure that the real scratch the really big scratches are taken care of this one two or three goes with this it's like a fine tuning of that process this this really does make a difference how long you stick to this one it makes much more of a difference than the polishing bit right at the end for example because you're, you're just visually shining that here this is where you're making the kind of foundation of your fret playable or more playable so as i say worth um doing two or three of these into the sheet where the paper I felt it so that's one done some people sometimes wonder why I don't stop the video at this point probably because it's almost too much trouble um, in doing this um, you know, time is money, and uh, one of the reasons I don't edit videos is it doesn't serve me any better purpose. The purpose of these videos is, is to help prospective customers uh, get a sense of what's been done to their guitars, and uh, hopefully where it works well, um, to give them some confidence in um, the way the guitar's been set up. Um, if you're, you know, if you're looking to spend a couple of hundred pounds on uh, a budget guitar like this, and it's been done at 150 pounds, then uh, you'll watch as much of this video as you need to to, to make your decision whether it's uh, a good, good prospect or not. And, you know, kind of, but I'm, I credit you with the sense of knowing when to press the uh, stop button or the fast forward. I don't need to. Um, try and make that decision for you by doing some fancy editing and it's also not about making this look really slick or cool this is this is about this not the video part of it really um, and i'm also not i'm not trying to build up a, a youtube channel for the sake of being liked um, it's purely for the sake of um, giving you a good um, a good sense of what the guitar's like you know, for, for some other people, obviously, um, there's a, another aspect of it, which is uh, some people can use it to help them uh, do something on their guitar as well, which is you know, nice, a nice added bonus. Uh, but I didn't set out primarily with that objective. I mean, I knew that, that it would do that, but I didn't set out to be an expert on this or to... Um, to be the place to go online to learn how to do something. There are plenty of shorter videos for that um, and lots of great stuff. Anyway, so we've done the 600 now and, and now it's time to move on to the Micromesh. And again, this set now runs from 1500 through to 12,000, which is incredibly fine. Um, but the jump from 600 to 15 is quite big. So on this one, I usually spend a couple of minutes just because it takes a bit longer to get all the scratching on here to the, uh, or down to the, the, the uh, particle size of the, the thingy, abrasive on here, scratchy thing, you know, whatever it's called. If you're ever thinking about uh, doing 
guitar fixing. I'm sure many of you do. Learning to do fret, uh, refretting is one of the most satisfying uh, investments you can make. And it isn't that expensive. Um, you know, I think the, the press I bought was, I don't know, probably about £65. The, the fret call the, the, with the inserts for pressing in the frets, that was maybe £50 from Stu Mac in the US. Uh, and then I'm paying maybe 10 to 15 pounds a second spread, which is a lot compared to buying the materials yourself, but at the moment I don't have a fret bending uh, tool. I don't know if that's a radius in tool, but if I had, then I could buy it in bulk and uh, do the radius thing myself. But right now it's convenient to buy uh, the pre-radius things, although a little bit limiting. I don't have too much of a choice, especially when you're searching on eBay, which can be really confusing. Many vendors, really infuriatingly, many of the vendors who sell uh, fretwire on their listings put all kinds of information that you don't need to know, and the one piece of information they leave out, the most important piece is the radius uh, of the fretwire. So, I'm sure many a sale, certainly from my perspective, many a sale has already been lost because I can't find uh, what it is they're selling and it's too much trouble to pose a question and, and hope that they'll come back. So I thought that these frets here came from the US because the UK sellers missed out that information on all of their listings. Can you believe it? A little piece of feedback if you happen to be in that business. If you're wondering why you're not selling many fret sets of pre-radius frets, it's because you aren't putting, probably because you aren't putting the uh, radius on the list. So, so I bought from the US both times because somebody there was smart enough to realise that that's probably the most important piece of information that a hobbyist or a, uh, a startup luthier is going to be looking for. I've got a guitar I need just a set of frets. And the one thing that matters to me is the radius. The second thing is the gauge. Jumbo or fine or tall or whatever. But most of the time it's the radius. Anyway. Uh, so yeah, you know, back to the whole point. Uh, the point being is there's nothing more satisfying than taking an old worn out neck uh, and making it come back to life. It really does feel like what, I mean, the, you don't have to be a guitar maker, which I'm not. I mean, I have made a, a guitar, but um, first and foremost, I'm a setter-upper and seller of set-up set guitars. But, Around guitar, so this uh, this ability to, to put some new frets into an old neck and bring it back to life is just wonderful. So so rewarding. Okay, so we're on eight thousand now, and we've got one more after this, and then we run over with the drum and we're done. And this guitar, short of the bodywork just being polished, where I've done those repairs. Um, then that guitar next weekend will be ready to put together and set up. Wow, I'd be so proud of this. What's great about these is that because they're brand new, even with fret levelling, there's still tons of material on them, so they look really chunky and healthy and beautifully rounded. Oh yeah, love it. Right, let's uh, let's just get this done, then we can uh, move on to other things. But so. If, Right now it's time to dremel, dremel this uh, and then do a grand reveal as we sort of show the fruits of our labours. Um, for a while I wasn't doing, um, for a while I didn't do a, a dremel polishing a part of this process because many of the things, the polishes I tried, weren't really adding anything to the 12,000. That 12,000 uh, micromesh is incredibly uh, fine and you can play this straight off now. All that this now does is add uh, a layer of shine to it and that's it really. Um, now the thing to remember, I'm just going to put a, try and put a bit on top of each fret uh, and I'll come back and polish them individually. The thing to remember here is um, when you're using this thing, hold it. You've got to hold it with two hands. If you don't, uh, you're going to pay for it because the first thing that will happen 
is that the, the mop will, because of the spin, it will pull, it will pull your, uh, pull itself off, it will flip off the end there. And if it does that, um, what's going to happen is the chuck of this thing is going to bang onto the fret. And I'm telling you now, if the chuck of your Dremel hits the fret, you're literally going to start again, back to fret level and all over again, which is it's a real shame. So of all the things that can catch you out at the last minute, this is it. Uh, you've got to do this with two hands. And even then, don't assume that you're going to get away with it. Um, because even just having this, having the angle wrong, uh, can, can cause you a, a, a catastrophe. This thing spits everywhere, it's horrible. So you can see that always this, this chuck is, is threatening disaster. And that, it's got loads of little um, knurly bits, for, obviously, for you, to, um, for you to do it up. But if that comes down at speed on these frets, it's curtains. So no matter how fast you want to get this done, or how cavalier you want to be, two hands at all times. And even that isn't a guarantee. You see I'm doing it slightly downward as well to give myself as much clearance between these frets and this chuck as possible. Oh, these are good looking frets, I tell you. I'm going to make a big selling point on this listing of these frets because actually instead of seeing it as a negative that the previous owner you know, kind of fobbed me off with a worn out guitar, actually the truth is now you've got, you're getting a guitar with a brand new neck and then everything about this is better than it was when it came out of the factory. And then you've got the same amount of fret material as it was when it was brand new in 1980 something. But better than that, you've got it all leveled, which you didn't have when it came out of the factory in 1980, whatever. So I can I can say confidently this is considerably better than you on any any guitar where I do this. Concentrating all the way with two hands. Now, this is the bit that the customer, if you're doing this for someone else, this is the bit the customer's going to remember. The, the condition of these frets when they pick the guitar up and feel the action. It's going to be the work you did here as much as anything else, more than anything else, really. It's going to make the difference. You see that's trying to pull itself off the end. If I didn't have two hands on that, I would have lost control of that twice just then. And that would have yanked the uh, Dremel over to the right, and it would have hit, decked out, probably on the fret next to it. So this is a filthy old process. You can see how dirty it is. There's bits of mop flying everywhere. Um, your neck is going to need a, a good clean-up after this. But it's worth it. Righty ho all done. <sighs> Mucky. Okay, so I have the pleasure of tipping it over and then using these cleverly placed tabs um, where I stuck the paper to itself and not didn't just wrap it round onto the neck. Uh, it makes a, a sort of pull-off tab, which makes it a lot easier at this stage to get it off. I promise you. Having done this 80 odd times now or more, um, take my word for it. This is an easier way of doing it. It still leaves a bit of uh, goo on there. You can scrape it off with your finger, or you can get the solvent on it. The naphtha. When I say solvent, I mean lighter fluid. Don't go using alcohol or some strange material which will 
likely to soften the surface lacquer or the finished lacquer. Um, but don't worry about bits of tape glue, that will come off with naphtha, that's what it's for. And uh, in a minute now, I will get this one. Sometimes they break, but most of the time you can spread them out either side and then you're ready to flip over and to do the brand. Highly satisfying review. Good to have thumbnails for this part of it. Um, good to have thumbnails anyway, because biting your nails is a silly habit. And I only say that because I stopped biting my nails I don't know, 20 years ago or something on a particular day, and the day was I was on holiday in Trinidad with some friends, the place I was born years ago, obviously. Um, and it's a place that are miles from a dentist or whatever, and I broke my tooth in half right down to the kind of gum line by biting my own fingernail. Believe me, how, how stupid is that to break your own teeth? I had to then suffer a few weeks, a couple of weeks of not being able to do anything to fix it and then cost me a fortune back at the dentist. Well, back, actually in those days it didn't cost a fortune because it was free but um, it cost me quite a bit of sitting in a chair having a tooth replacement thing built on stilts, some sort of weird filling. Anyway, point is, the embarrassment of the dentist saying, oh, how did you break that then? And me saying, well, uh, biting my own fingernails. Which sounds pretty, not only disgusting, but also pretty pathetic when you think about it. Okay, so you will have a very grubby neck at this point, and you will want to give it a once over with solvent and down the sides of the frets, get rid of any of the um, polishing goo and, and or uh, marker pen that might have got down there. Go down the sides, get rid of the tape. Um, along the back, get rid of the glue from the tape. Down the side again, just a couple of bits need coming off, come on. And once they're off, and then just over the top too because that will be full of um, grime. And there we have it. A beautiful, brand new, shiny uh, neck, perfectly leveled for this 80s Squire Korean made Stratocaster. Um, so tempted now, the, the danger now is you just want to go and put this thing back together again because that is so nice. Ready to play, it's, it's never been as good as this. Um, and it's brilliant to be able to say that. And, uh, and to know you did it yourself, in your own shed. Uh, without having a degree in it, you know, just having taken some time, having spent a, a bit on some the necessary pieces of equipment that you need. Uh, you know, for example, a lot of places online say, well, you can press in frets using your drill press over here. Um, and the truth is, you can't really, because the drill press that most people have, which is this sort of budget home, home, uh, home use quality thing, um, that, doesn't, that doesn't build up nearly enough downward force, it's not strong enough. You need a, a good chunky um, press arbor or whatever, I can't, it's arbor press, arbor press, that makes more sense. Uh, you need a, a one ton arbor press to do it. Um, and of course you don't put a ton of, pr of pressure onto this neck, but you do uh, use it to press it down um, securely. So there we have it, 22 brand new frets, all absolutely dead, spankingly level, ready to be reinstalled and played on. That looks fabulous. It looks just the best it's ever looked. Love it. Okay, now if you just watched that uh, and you're watching the Sun Mustang video, same process, exactly the same, okay? Blimey, right, just a quick, uh, drop back in here um, just to show you two wonderful necks. Look at those. Look at that. Beautiful, re-fretted. I'm so pleased. That is a 1980s Samick made uh, Squire, Korean Squire, that was worn out beyond belief. But now look at this. You've got brand new leveled frets, shine to perfection. 
waiting to go. And here we have Morris coming through. Here we have um, the 1990 Sun Mustang. And uh, look at that. Re-radiused to 7.25. So a, a kind of more vintage curve to it. Beautiful new vintage style frets in there. Um, very fine, very narrow frets. And uh, just ready to go. The only downside of this one, if if at all, is the fact you've got the bleed through of the markers on the side. But to me, that's a minor thing when you consider that it's got a new lease of life um, and in a sort of classic Strat um, radius as well, which I'm really pleased at. So I've got, um, I'm going to oil these very quickly, just get them sort of rehydrated slightly. If I can find where I put the blasted oil which is always a problem. There it is. Sorry about that. Just had to move you for a moment. Oh my God, you're going to fall over. Um, so I'm just going to oil these slightly. Um, if I could find an old cloth to do it with, I'd be happier. I've decided today I'm going to, I'm not going to tackle the um, Mineric Inferno any further. I, I'd be rushing it and I don't want to do that. So I'm going to leave that till next week and uh, do it proper uh, rather than run run too quickly on it. So just giving each of these fingerboards a bit of uh, an oiling up and I'm just going to rub off the excess as well. It's nice to have a bit of colour but I don't want it, I don't want it um, dripping in the stuff. So these two necks now are pretty much ready. I'm going to do some work on both of them a bit more now, I'm going to pot all of these, because um, I'm going to find some tuners to go on the Sun Mustang. Um, I'm, I was thinking about buying some, and then I think I've probably got a set that, that will work on those. Um, so I'm going to sort of do a little experiment, see what works, and then also on both of these I'm going to make a water slide decal for the rear side of both of these with his Lordship, Morris the Cat. Um, smiling beatifically from the back of the guitar. Uh, in this case, because it's a, it's going to be a, say, a seller guitar, not, not my own, I'm not going to put it on the front side, but uh, and I'm going to use a quite a res refined logo. I'll show you. I'm going to have a little uh, little tiny one. Oh, gosh, it's got dirty. That's nice. Somebody's put the footprints on it. Anyway, there's some there I can use. Um, yeah, I'm going to use a, a little tiny one here on the back side of the headstock. And... Um, along with it, the numbering system anyway that I usually use. So here we have the, the next kind of oiled a little bit. This, this Squire, um, Squire Korean one really responds to that oil and its real darkness comes back out because this is a this is a well played, or was a very well played old beastie. And uh, wow, is that ever looking nice now? I'm so pleased. So like I said a minute ago on the video, on the other video while I was doing these, um, Refretting is probably one of the most satisfying things you could possibly learn to do, and you know, it's no exaggeration to tell you this is my third, second, and third refret ever. Okay, and they're looking wonderful. So, and they're perfectly level, and everything's sitting nicely. So, you know, you don't have to wait all your life to do this. You can learn to do it in fairly uh, short order, and you can do it very well if you approach it with a kind of logic and a care that you can bring into everything you do. <coughs> and of course you need something like that <coughs> to make it work. Um, and uh, it's not a huge investment, but it's, <coughs> it's really important to have. So, sorry, face full. Um, like I said, that is uh, second refrets ref number two and three, that's all. Look how good they look, and they're going to play brilliantly too. Uh, so the, the interesting bit for me now is to work on. I'm going to have to cut the cut the video in a minute because it'll just be fiddling around for a while. But this one, um, they both look. They're in good condition on the back. If I'm going to put a a water slide on both of them, then I have to do a bit of lacquering on the back of here, which is okay. It just takes a test. Will add a bit of work to this guitar. Um, I've got plenty of spray lacquer, so it's not going to. I'm not going to struggle to do it. This one's probably better condition. There's a hair 
already caught under the lacquer here anyway, so I'd be quite happy to take that off. Um, so I'll do a bit of sanding on both of these, and then I'll put the water slides on, uh, and then I'll do a bit of spraying. Um, but I won't need too much. It, actually, interestingly, the water slides do need quite a bit of lacquer spraying on top, because otherwise they stand out proud and they look a bit tacky. Um, so I guess the advice would be, if you're going to put water slides on, be committed to why you're doing them. And actually, I have a feeling that it, I might be tempted not to do it on this one, but this one probably could use it anyway, because I'm either going to have to drill some holes out there, do some work there, and also there's a hair. So there's a good reason to do it on there. Uh, this one <coughs> is probably could just do with the normal reloved numbering system. Um, until I work out whether it's something I want to do all the time or not, but certainly this is crying out for it, which is cool. Right, so what is the plan? Well, I suppose the plan would be to get a little support <coughs> block, get a little sanding block, and um, hey, we can just get straight into it, really. <coughs> the inkjet paper is quite... Uh, it's relatively expensive, so unfortunately I've sort of slightly spoiled one of my four um, one of my four sheets or five sheets the maximum you get, which is a shame um, by leaving it out here in the, in the shed. So um, I'll, I'll have to cut out some of those uh, and rescue as many as I can from that. But ideally, I would have left that indoors. Um, it didn't come to any harm. Now, just looking at this headstock here, the Sun Mustang, um, it's going to take me a while to get down to this. It's amazing. That hair is quite a far away down. Because it had just been lacquered over and left, um, what happens is, it's really funny, that you put something on there and the lacquer goes, so you spray it on, lacquer goes, lacquer, 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 over the thing, lacquer, 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 down the thing, and it never quite builds up what you're hoping for is that it would build up either side and then meet the the bit and the same applies here so this hair was you could feel it because it had the lacquer had built up over the hair now i've taken the lacquer down the hair is still under there but it now it's at the same level as all of the rest of it so if i carried on going then the next thing would happen is i would come to the the level of the hair itself um what I'm hoping it isn't too far down. Uh, I'm starting to see it poking through now. I don't want it to be too far down. Having said that, it's not too much of a problem because I'm going to chuck on quite a lot of new lacquer when I come to putting the water slide on here. Um, so are we at the hair yet? My God, we're not. We're still in there. It's amazing. <laughs> uh, am I going to worry about it? That really what I came here to do. It's a point of you know time to have a sort of choice really. I think do I really care about it enough? Uh, I don't think I do actually. I don't want to go right the way down to the wood here just for the sake of getting rid of that hair. So the front's okay. Um, could probably do with polishing, but I won't do it with sanding it too far. So now we have um, a nice smooth, dry, clean surface uh, on this headstock, which. As long as it's as dust is off, we can then comfortably apply the uh, water slide to wherever we want it to go. Um, I guess before I do that, I might want to hang this one up. <coughs> I might want to just um, think about the tuners end of things uh, and see what I actually have got spare. That's a six in line set. Um, and these got little. Yeah, little locating lugs. Now, it's not impossible. I can have a look at them and see if they work. I mean, it, to be honest, anything anything is better than those initial things. So we've got six here. They all look the same, except one of them isn't not quite the same. Although in almost every respect, it's almost identical. It has, has a different locating lug arrangement, which is fine. So we could use these, but what it's going to demand is that I put on um, a cut out. I'm going to have to cut out some uh, thingies, new lug holes and fill the old ones. Um, 
the only other way around it <coughs> is you can get a nice vintage inline set to go on a, a strat. <coughs> excuse me, a strat, uh, and that again that would cost about twenty quid, which would be a simple solution. It would would take away any need to do any um, drilling. Do I want to do that, or do I want to use up some of this stuff that I've got knocking around? Because to be honest, having this around is not doing me any good sitting here in a box. So I think I would much prefer to put these things to work um, rather than spend more money on this particular guitar, which I've already had to um, re thingy. You know the word, refret. So I think that's going to be what I'll do, um, which means I'm going to. Before I do anything with Lacquer, <coughs> his Royal Highness's mugshot onto there as a logo. I think the, the first thing I'd need to do is uh, filling of these existing holes, um, which is then actually going to set me up with some sanding uh, anyway, which would need to go over the top of this. So I might well still get rid of that hair before the day is out. So I'm going to fill these holes. I'm going to need to make some new ones when it comes to fixing these. But fill these first, uh, cut them flush, sand them flush, uh, and then re-drill this and drill out these holes, which I can do quite nicely with the pillar drill um, without any worry. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get six of these things, so I've probably got 12 holes there, break it in half, um, and I'm going to want to just Slightly trim off the very ends of these things. There goes, there goes the logo getting moved around again. No wonder they uh, don't end up in good nick. So I'm going to cl clip off the ends of these because I want them to fit in, not just to be. Uh, I, I don't want them to be just sort of the pointed tips touching the bottom of the, the hole. I want as much of the thing to go on as possible. I just want a bit of taper at the top. <coughs> so I've cut them all off and I'm just laying them down so I know which end's been cut really. Um, and I'm going to get myself a bit of galau. Uh, and I'll take the easy way out. I never have the right thing to put glue into but I'm just going to blob some on here which I can dip into. Um, the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get myself a little get there. Uh, where is it gone? I want the heavy thing which isn't around. Okay, if I can't find it I'll, I'll use this one. I just, oh there it is. I just need something to tap down on the um, on the headstock because I want these things to go in as well as they can fit in. So I'm going to take the first one and I'm just going to use that one to blob some glue on all of them. Um, now this glue sits at the top obviously, it doesn't go anywhere inside, it's kind of, it's never really going to drip into there, you can, kind of hopeless, you, if you had a microscopic syringe you might manage to get it to go down there, but you'd have to start at the bottom and then you'd have to have a, a, way, a way for the air to get out, at the same time as you're pumping in glue and the physics don't actually allow that to happen, strangely enough. So. What I'm suggest is you just put some on the top there and then you twiddle your stick and shove it in. <laughs> Excuse the expression. Um, and the best you can hope for, I oh, split. That's no good. The best you can hope for, really, is getting just a bit of glue on the stick that goes down the side. So sort of pull it in, in and out. And you can see you'll get uh, a load of. Um, glue sticking up over the top, but that's fine, we'll take that off. And I think actually these are quite stiff as it is, I don't need to hit them, bang them in too much. Um, so it's a fairly simple, straightforward way of doing it. Now each of these new tuners has got, um, that one doesn't fit very well, I think I didn't cut enough off. Each of these um, new tuners has, most of them have two little locating lugs and we're going to have to drill a little hole again when it comes to um, putting those in. But to do it, I can't really do it now until I know where those holes 
uh, should be or where the tuner sits. So I think um, we could probably do it in a number of ways, but once the once we've drilled out the hole and we've prepared this and done it flush and put the logo on and all that stuff, then what I'll do is I will put some pen or something on the or a drop drop of lacquer onto the end of the these little if you can see them from there these little locating studs here and here I'll put a tiny bit of uh, colour or lacquer on the end cherry lacquer or something and I'll just turn them over and, and locate them onto there and then we'll be able to see where the points touch and then we'll drill a couple of little locating holes okay it's going in quite well and they're going in quite nice and tight as well so that's the that's the lot done and sometimes what I do is um, I'll then cut them cut them off to about a half a centimetre something like that just because the longer they are sticking out the more trouble we can get into if we hit them against something and I'll break the join um, and also <clears throat> before too long then I can go in and my next cut can be right down to the level and uh, without too much trouble and then I can go down to the level of the glue and at that level that stage it's straight forward because um, we're still going to sand over the top once it's all dried so I'm just using this as a little bit of additional help okay so I'm going to stop there with that hang it up let it dry um, and then next stage after that will be to drill out mark up and drill out the holes um, and after that it will be to locate the screw the little drill holes for these um, and then it will be a case of before we put anything on hardware we'll, we'll do the logo part and re lacquer this uh, side of the neck uh, headstock okay so see you shortly